How's everybody doing? All right. I like the enthusiasm. If you'd like to stand, we're going to get started with worship here in just a minute. Let's just pray real quick. Father, thank you for today. We give you so much glory this morning, Lord. Be honored by this worship. Uh, be with Pastor Tim as he travels today and during these uh, this time. And just uh, be with them. Bless him and Jen as they get some time alone together. Father, we thank you for the leadership and the willingness to step up here um, in the meantime. And Father, we just pray for our church in this moment. Thank you, Father, for who you are and what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's sing about this glorious day. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you And I was breathing Till I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. today shake hands say hi from afar and welcome to the well
time for announcements. Everybody say good morning to Kevin. Good morning. What's up? Well, welcome. If you're a guest, we just say welcome. We hope that you enjoy it. We hope you truly feel welcome here. And uh, there's always weirdness at church, but hopefully it's not too much. Hopefully you kind of see who, who we are and, and what we do. Uh, one of the biggest things we do is is we're, we're a church, so we read the Bible and uh, we open it and believe it and let that be the guide of who we are and what we do. So I hope that you truly see that and feel that. Um, and uh, um, yeah, there's so much cool stuff happening at the well. Uh, if you want to get to know us a little more, you would like us to get to know you a, more, a little more. Um, we have uh, these beautiful connection cards for guests, or if you want to sign up for stuff, uh, give us all your information. Uh, we've been selling it lately as a fundraiser, so um, if, you don't, if you don't mind, just give us your mom and dad's information too, and we'll, uh, I'm just kidding. We don't sell your information. <laughs> we hardly even use these things, but they are very important, but we don't, we don't like mess with you or send you tons of emails. You gotten a few lately because VBS and some stuff going on, but uh, I hope that I hope you really feel honored in how we like really just try to not overwhelm you with stuff. Speaking of stuff, have you guys noticed the new bulletins and they're getting updated and magic and all the stuff that's happening? If uh, if you have a phone and you take it out and you scan that thing on the front page, it takes you to a link tree, which is really cool. Thank you. It's for my donation for later. If you want to know how to donate, there's a bunch of different ways you could look. You can actually go. So on the link tree, here's a challenge that we're offering to the whole church. Everyone can take part. On the link tree from scanning the front of the bulletin, you could go to every one of the websites that we have, the Instagrams for the youth group, the children's for the well, uh, all that stuff. It's all there. And if you find an error, which I found an error today, and uh, it was in the bulletin, and it was totally my fault, but here's what we're going to do. If you find an error and you screenshot it and send it to me, we'll give you a free shirt. Is that fair? Is that cool? Right? It's awesome. So maybe every now and then we'll put a fake picture up and you'll be like, oh, that doesn't make sense. So maybe we'll do some stuff like that and have some fun with it. But we honestly want to get the most to you. We want you to have all the information of what's happening, all the things that are coming and going at the well. And so the, the, the error that I submitted for um, to be put in the bulletin was the wrong date for the men's event that's happening this Saturday, which is the 30th of July. So if you want to come hang out with us, men, we'll be in the back room hanging out, eating some really good food, uh, watching some, some fights on TV, and just enjoying hanging out and being together. So uh, hopefully you can make that. And then um, the next one says August 30th. That's August 20th. It's always going to be on a Saturday. So um, if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to me. But there's other stuff in here in the bulletin that you can see. Just some, some good stuff on the very back. Some places that we need people to help serve. Um, you know, we're called to serve and help the church. And the church doesn't function if we don't do that kind of stuff. So hopefully you use these to to just find out what's happening, what's going on. And, and uh, man, um, tons of stuff has been going on. It's been a wild, crazy summer. We just got back from camp on Friday, which was supposed to be Saturday. But uh, we had a great camp. You'll hear a lot more about it next week. We'll have some stories and a video and all that stuff that comes with the recaps. Um, but for the first time ever, I had to send a kid home from camp early. <gasps> Poor kid. He was super sick and uh, just just... The cough would not go away, and, and just, man, it was just too much. So the poor guy sent him home early, and, and that was a, a bummer. And then on Friday, we had a student test positive for COVID and, and all of the mess that comes with that. And so um, instead of quarantining half of our church and cabins, we just decided we're going to leave early and just do the best for the most. And so the nice thing was we got to spend that whole afternoon at Pinecrest and had a great day. And um, if you see kids around, ask them, did you go to camp? What happened? How did God talk to you? Or what did you decide at camp? Um, we had a whole bunch of stuff. One of the nights, we'll talk more about this next week, but we had the students just take something. Imagine this, adults, get a piece of paper, write something you want to overcome that you've never shared with another person basically your deepest, darkest secret, just right out there. Could you imagine? And so we prayed for him. And I had the kids call out, give me some names that represent who Jesus is to you. Healer, Savior, Caring, all these names just kept coming. And I said, does anything that's written on those papers change who Jesus is to you? No. And we just kept doing it and kept praying. And 
there's so many chains that are being worked on right there, and, and God's going to break some stuff down, and he already has. And so just if you think of that image, just think of a pile of mess, pile of sin. Just pray for it for our students. In James, it says to overcome your sin, share with a brother. So that became a way that, that only I'm going to be the only one who reads those, and I don't know which student's stuff is what, and I'm just going to pray for those continually. And I just encourage you, you don't even need to know what's written on those, but pray for our students and those things that they've written down because it is moving. And when we pray together as a church, what happens? God promises to answer. So I am amazed at what God does when we do that. So uh, with that, I'm going to pray for our church this morning. Thanks for being here. It's a great day. And uh, man, we're blessed to be at the well. God, I thank you so much for how, how you care for this church. God, you care for all your church across the world. But I love the fact that I'm an individual and there are so many individuals in this room and you know where we're at. You love us and you want to be in our lives and you're, you're calling us with purpose and you're calling us with, with a plan. And God, I pray that this morning is just a reminder of that. And as we hear uh, uh, three stories, God, and it just represents and shows us how much you care and love and, and want us. God, I thank you. I thank you for this place. I thank you for the servants here. I thank you for everyone who's in this room, who's online, watching and hearing this. God, there are so many things that we need answers to prayer to. And you know them, Lord. And I pray and ask that you just keep reminding those people who have major needs. You're with them. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow that the answer comes, but it's coming. And you're calling them into places that, that uh, you're going to use them with your amazing grace and love and gifts and talents, Lord. And I thank you for that. I pray that as we sing some songs, that it brings glory to you, that those words reflect in our hearts and our minds and remind us of, of there's so much that we get to be a part of with life in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Kevin. If you'd like to stand, we're going to go ahead and continue on in worship. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel overwhelmed. The best thing we can do is look to the Lord. Ask Him for the wisdom and the vision that He has. Because that's what can get us through.
that again. Here we go. so much thank you that we get to call you our shield and our hope and our strength and that all that is found in you God we give you glory let you be the king of our hearts this morning thank you father
so much praise. Give the Lord a hand clap. Father, we thank you for who you are and that you are a good, good Father. We thank you for today. Thank you for this time together and that you get to, we get to be a part of what you're doing here at the well, Father. I pray for Pastor David as he comes to deliver a message. I thank you for our friends um, and I thank you for Kevin for coming to introduce him this morning. In Jesus' mighty, powerful, beautiful name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Yeah, yeah. So I get I get to do the fun part of introducing a friend of mine. You guys met him a few months ago. Some of the students have known him for quite a while. But uh, when I first met David, he had just come to Modesto and uh, was working at Shelter Cove. And uh, it was in the midst of like my worst year ever. A lot of you know the story. And so we met and I was telling him about it. And I just remember thinking, he's never going to hang out with me again because of my bad juju. It's going to go all over him, and he's, gonna, he's never coming back. But um, we've, we've since become friends and done ministry stuff together, and, and uh, uh, my, kids, my daughter watched his kids sometimes. And, and just, just he's a good dude on top of he loves so much for students, and he cares. And I've, I've been able to watch in multiple areas, watch David just care for the gospel and take it wherever he goes. And so um, right now he's in transition, so we get to have him today. So I'm gonna have him come up. And he's done junior high ministry, high school ministry, all kinds of stuff. Um, he's a super good dude. And uh, um, just as you guys think of him this week, and I forgot to do this first service, but they'll pray for you anyway, hopefully. But he's, he's a free agent and he's looking for a job. And so um, God's got a plan for him. He's going to do some good stuff with David, and he's wherever you go. I'm kind of sad if he leaves Modesto. But anyways, but yeah, man, you guys enjoy David and have fun with him. He's a great guy, and uh, yeah, I hope you don't move too far. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Ah, well, hello, everybody. Um, that was very kind. Thank you, Kevin. Um, now, I remember that conversation that we had, Kevin, and whoop, almost lost a water bottle. Um, I remember that conversation that we had all those years ago, and uh, I would much rather have a conversation about that than about the weather, because um, I'm not a big, I don't care about the weather. It's hot. It's always hot. That's pretty, that's what we got. It's, anyways, um, so it's a pleasure to be here with you guys, privilege for me to come hang out with you all. Uh, today, we're going to be hanging out in the book of Luke chapter 15, and then there'll be a little bit of kind of moving around. Um, I'm excited to share with you all uh, what the Lord's been putting on my heart over the past few weeks. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, my dad had a friend who was in the military, and uh, the guy drove a Hummer vehicle, and uh, one of the, like the old, like the military Hummers, not like the H2, H3, um, which is still a Hummer, but not the military Hummers. Um, and it had no doors, and that was really cool. And I was like 11 or 12, so this was like the coolest thing that I'd ever seen in my life. And we got into this Hummer, and he took us out into like these back canyons in Southern California. And we're off-roading and bouncing around, and it's just so much fun. And then they stop, and we hit the end in this canyon. It was like a, th like a five-foot drop um, down into the next bit. They couldn't make it down. So we get out, my dad and... And the other guy, they were like trying to figure out where they were. We were just completely lost, had no idea where we were at, where we were going, what was happening. And I didn't know. I had no idea. I was with a friend of mine, the kids, the, the other guy's son. And we were just up in the canyons throwing dirt clouds at each other. And it was just a really fun time. Uh, we get back. Uh, after a while, they kind of they backtracked, figured out where we were. They looked at the map. We were in a canyon called Rattlesnake Canyon, and it was it was a hot day. It was it was a day where rattlesnakes would be out. So I we had no idea, but I was out there. We were lost, completely lost. Had no idea where we were at, and 
I was in danger. <laughs> and I had no idea that I was in danger. Um, and sometimes when we find ourselves lost, we can find ourselves in danger. Today we're going to be talking about three stories in Luke chapter 15 that all revolve around things that are lost that have been found. Right? Jesus, he's hanging out with a bunch of sinners, which is who Jesus often found himself hanging out with. Um, and then the religious people, he, they showed up. And Jesus, uh, they were whispering and judging Jesus. And Jesus, as he does, uh, just decided to talk to all of them. So he was talking to, in this setting, uh, the sinners. He was talking to the saints. And in this setting, he's also talking to you and I. And he tells three stories that if you've been in church for any amount of time, you probably are familiar with. Uh, they're right up here on the screens. There's the lost sheep. Then uh, he found the sheep. And these stories, they all follow like the same formula, right? There's, there's the sheep that gets lost. Uh, the shepherd goes and finds the sheep. And then they rejoice. And then there's a woman who lost her coin. Uh, she looks for the coin, she finds the coin, and then they rejoice, and then there's the son who is lost, and then is found again, and then they rejoice. Those three passages, they kind of follow that same uh, formula every single time. And Jesus is talking to the religious people, and he's also talking to the sinners. So in our situation, he's also talking to us in that same place. And those are the kind of two boats that we find ourselves in. There's the people who are lost, who essentially, in this, the Christian way, like, it's just people that don't know Jesus yet. There's the lost people. And then there's people who've been found, but also find themselves lost sometimes. I think as followers of Jesus, we can kind of find ourselves as lost occasionally. So essentially, Jesus is talking here to everybody, all of us in this place. We are all find ourselves in that boat. Uh, regardless of which boat you're in, the, the point of these stories is to show you how valuable you are to God. I got to do this. The point of the story is to show you how valuable you are to God. Um, at the last service, uh, I just got into this worst coughing fit of my life, um, one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Um, and uh, so I'm going to be drinking water occasionally so that this doesn't happen again because I don't want to experience that again. Um, so the point of these stories is to show you how valuable you are to God, right? Is, is to say that he's going to leave the 99 sheep safe in the pasture and he's going to traverse the dangerous and wild lands to go after the one that ran away. It, it's, it's saying that he's going to tear his house apart, turn over every couch cushion to find the coin that he lost and that he will wait for you and then run to you with abandon when you turn back to him in repentance. Uh, what, what, that, that is the purpose of this, right? But one of the things that God's been teaching me, he's been kind of reminding me of lately, is why we have the Bible, right? We, we have the Bible so that we can know God, yes, absolutely, and amen, but the Bible is also used for us as finite, small, in the grand scheme of eternity, we're very minuscule beings, the Bible tells us how we as these small beings can interact with the amazing, awesome, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere God of the universe, right? Because we can't, we wouldn't know how to do that without the Bible. So the Bible tells us how we get to interact with God. And in this passage, I think it's really cool because there are three different stories that Jesus uses to show us how we interact with him. Right? You can look up on the screens. There's the, the shepherd and the sheep, the worker and his wages. Uh, that one, if you are familiar with the story of the lost coin, that one, it was a little hard. I'll, I'll let you know what I mean by that in a minute. So if you're like, what? I get it. Um, and I was there too. But, and then the last one is the father and the son. And, and Jesus kind of shows us that we get to interact with God uh, in these three different types of relationships. And I want to talk about these three different types of relationships today. The first one that I want to talk to you guys about is the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd and the sheep. Luke chapter 15, verse 4 says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Right? Now, 
this passage, it doesn't speak too much about the shepherd and the sheep the, their relationship, right? Um, so in order for us to kind of jump into how we interact with God as a shepherd, I want to look at Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a wonderful passage that shows us uh, David reflecting on God as our shepherd, and it shows us how a good shepherd will provide, lead, and offer security to the flock. So first, let's see how he provides. Um, Psalm 23, verse 1, says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. Other translations of this passage, it says, I, I lack nothing. That everything that I need, I have. Right? There is nothing that I need that my shepherd does not provide for me. When, uh, think about this. When the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness after they had left Egypt, they were wandering in the wilderness and they needed food, so God gave them manna. Right? They'd wake up in the morning and there would be magic food just laying on the ground for them to pick up. And God commanded, he said, hey, um, I want you to, to, to take what you need for the day and just what you need for the day. Don't take any more. Don't take any less. Take what you need for the day. And, and sometimes they took extra and then by the end of the day or the next day, it was all rotten with like maggots and stuff. And so, so what God was doing, we were showing them that every single day that he is going to give them exactly what they need. That, that every single day he's going to provide for them the things that they needed in their life. My wife and I, we, uh, before we were here in Modesto, we lived in Belize as missionaries. And it was an, an, an amazing experience. We, it was a, a spiritual boot camp. I had been a Christian my whole life before that. But I learned more about God and the Holy Spirit in those three months than I had in my entire life. It was an amazing time. One of the things that happened while we were there, uh, we, we didn't have uh, all the support that we needed uh, financially while we were there sometimes. So there would be times where we wouldn't have a lot of money. And this time, actually, it was about two months in, I'm looking at my bank account, and uh, I see the color red, which is never a good sign when you're looking at your bank account. Um, so I, I see that we have negative money, and I look at my passport, and I think, oh, uh, our visas are due tomorrow. And uh, visas in Belize are $50 US per person, and we have like 1,000 children. So it, it was, um, was going to be $250 US. Uh, we had three kids at the time. Uh, we have four now. Um, so had three kids at the time. It was going to be $250 US. We had negative money, and I was thinking, well, it was a good run. Uh, that was, it was nice, but I think we're done. I think we're done in Belize. We're going to have to, we're going to get kicked out. Um, and, and that was a Sunday morning. And I uh, go to church, we pray, hang out, just kind of live our lives thinking like, okay, we'll, 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 this has been good. Uh, at night, someone knocks on our door. They open up, I open the door up and, and they say, hey, uh, this is the offering from the church uh, this morning. Um, we felt like the Lord was telling us to give this money to you. It was $250 US. Um, yeah. And it is, that is God providing uh, for his people. It's God giving his people what he needs, what they need um, every single day, right? Uh, we have a shepherd that loves to provide for his sheep. There was never a day that my wife and I couldn't put food on the table in Belize. Sometimes that food would be an apple or a piece of bread, but we had the food. We had what we needed. It was difficult sometimes, but God gave us what we needed. Maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, well, okay, David, but you know, sometimes I can feel like I may just need a little bit of help right now. I, I, this, this is a little bit too much. I don't quite get it. Um, and I know that in my life there's been times where there, there were things that I was expecting to receive from God that I didn't get, right? Uh, th asking for healing or asking for the job or asking for whatever it is. Um, in, in those times in your life when we don't receive what we feel like we need from God, it's easy for us to get discouraged or depressed or down uh, because we didn't receive what we thought we needed. And it's like, God, I need this. Um, that's the thing that God is the one that decides what we need. Unfortunately, um, sometimes uh, for us, where we feel like we need a little bit more, actually probably more fortunately for us, um, but I've been there. And, and what I can say, probably the only thing that I can say, what I've learned is this, is that 
even in those times where it feels like we don't have enough or we didn't receive what we wanted to get, this is what I've learned to be true, is that God is our provision. That God is everything that we need. That he will sustain you through all of the times in, in all of the situations and he will never let you down. And in everything, uh, this world can take away everything that you have and Jesus is still enough. His presence in your life will be provision for what you need as you walk this world. Um, he is enough. So our shepherd, he provides for us. The question that I have for you is, are you trusting him? Next, we see that our shepherd leads us. We see that our shepherd leads us. Uh, verses 2 and 3 in Psalm, 20, Psalm 23 says this, uh, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Um, the last month of my life has been pretty crazy. Um, traveled a whole lot. My wife left June 27th, uh, took the kids down to Southern California, closer to family. She was house sitting for a friend down there. Um, I joined her on uh, July 7th. And uh, then we drove down into Mexico, and I spent a week in Mexico I was speaking at a missions camp down there for some high school students. And uh, I spent a week there, spent uh, a weekend in, um, on, near the beach in Southern California, and then uh, came up, or I guess not really up, because this is more up, but still in Southern California, we went up into a mountain and had a family camp, spent some time at a family camp um, just with the family. But we have been, it's been go, 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 go. We've been moving and going and going and going. Um, and this is kind of what I feel. I, I feel refreshed. I feel good, right? Like I, I feel like while I was going, even though I was moving and I was active, I was still spending time with Jesus. I was still focusing on his word and worshiping and those things. Um, and I know, though, that there's been times where I've vacationed. Um, and have you guys ever experienced where you have vacationed and then you need a vacation after your vacation? You get home and you're like, I need to go back to bed. This is not, the, yeah, I, I've absolutely been there. Um, but what I think that we've done is I think that we've mis, uh, misunderstood what real rest is. I think we mistake rest as inactivity where we just don't do anything and then we're somehow magically going to get filled up. When when if you look biblically, you can see rest is actually from Jesus. And he says, come to me, those of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right? We, we rest in Jesus. Right? We, we, Jesus teaches us that if we want deep rest, real rest for our souls, then the only way that we can achieve that is through him. He's a shepherd. And it says that he makes me lie down in green pastures. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what it, when it, the, the words when it says he makes me lie down in green pastures, it, it is much more like, not like lay down, because that's not restful at all. It's much more like he leads me to a place where I'm able to rest, where, where, I can, where I'm able to lay down in green pastures. Um, so he shows us how we can rest. He leads us. He's a shepherd that leads us to rest. Um, and we can even see, looking back to the people of Israel, right? When they were wandering in the wilderness, uh, God led them, right? He led them two different ways. By day, he gave them a cloud over their head. And then when it was nighttime, he, he was a pillar of fire. And, and the people would follow the cloud. They would follow the fire. And, and God would take them where they were supposed to go. He leads them. I was struck by this just uh, as, as I was reading about it. Think about this. When, when you're, I don't know, the Middle East, from what I hear, it's really, really hot in the daytime. And what I know of deserts is that it's really, really cold at nighttime. So, so during the day, the people of Israel, they're walking, they're being led by God, and, and they're following this cloud. The sun is pounding down on their heads. They're hot. They're sweaty. When, when you are in the middle of the desert, the one thing that you're going to want is a cloud, 
right? Because that cloud is going to protect you from the sun. It's going to cool you down a little bit, give you a little bit of shade. And then in the opposite of that, at nighttime, when they're wandering through the desert, God revealed himself as fire, and they followed him by fire. And it's freezing cold in the desert at night, and they needed a fire. So God physically, tangibly led them gently through the wilderness, and he wants to do that for us as well. It's not some like abstract thing that God is like up there somewhere trying to lead us and it's based on this feeling, but God really actually wants to lead us as we walk with him, right? So my question for you is God is leading you. The question is, are you following him? Um, in Luke 9, 23, it says, and he said to all, Jesus said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Have you denied yourself those, those fleshly desires that creep up? Have you denied those? Do you, do you, uh, have you taken up your cross daily? Are you, are you, are you dying to self every single day so that you can live for Jesus? Right? Or as Romans puts it, are you offering your lives as a living sacrifice to God? Right? He's leading you. Are you following him? He is providing for you. Are you trusting him? And lastly, the good shepherd, he secures us. He secures us. It says, even though in verses 4 and 6 of Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So lastly, he secures us. Take a look at verse 5. Verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't know who needs to hear this, but your enemy is not your coworker, um, no matter how much you may feel that they are. Um, or your enemy is not the person that cuts you off in the freeway, right? Um, not that person who betrayed your trust back in high school. Um, your enemy is the devil. It's the spiritual forces. It's, it's the, the things that we cannot see, right? Um, but I was a little bit confused by this as a grow when I was growing up when I actually when I was 19 I, I, something kind of confronted my idea of God's protection in my life because um, I had grown up as a Christian and I had always believed like oh God's protecting us he's keeping us safe this is wonderful this is great I was 19 and driving up a mountain to go to my work there was somebody driving down the mountain and, and they, they started, I, they were flying. They were going so fast. And they went a little too fast, got into the dirt over here, swerved back this way into the dirt over here, swerved back this way and hit a berm. Dramatic pause. Uh, they hit the berm and they flipped upside down and landed um, inside, like underneath the tree upside down. And I was, I was watching this like, oh my gosh this is awful. So I, I park and I, I see if I can go help. And there was nothing that I could do. The person was pinned in the car and they were in pain and there was nothing that I could do other than say like, Hey, we're, we're going to get help. We're getting help. Um, just hold on, hold on. Um, the ambulance came, fire trucks came, they pulled the person out and the person ended up passing away. And, and I remember like I was 19 and I was thinking, God, you didn't protect this person. He was somebody that worked at the same camp that I was working at. Um, he was driving home from work. I was driving to work. And God, you didn't protect this person. I, like, what is this? And, and I learned that the protection, the physical protection that God offers us kind of rests in this. It's that God knows the day and the hour that we're going to go. And, and that we are protected by him and we are in his hand until the moment that we're going to breathe our last. And that is in his plan. That is what he knows is going to happen. And he's going to protect us until that moment. And he's going to lead us to that moment so that ultimately we get to see him again in heaven. And that's our physical protection. And, and we can find peace in that. We can find rest in that because it's not going to, our death is not going to catch God off guard. He knows what's happening. He knows when we're going to go. And, and we can rest in that. We can trust his plan for us. 
Uh, but when, when these verses are talking about protection, what I've come to learn is that these are much more about our eternal security than our physical security. In Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 13 and 14, up on the screens, it says this, In him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. It says that you are sealed, you're, you're sealed in the Holy Spirit. That's like an envelope seal, right? That's, that's like the, the envelope with a little bit of wax and then the press. And that means that you, that you are in the envelope, that you are there, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are covered, and you'll be delivered into our eternal residence. And then there's also this. It says that, that we are, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The guarantee, that's like the security deposit, right? Um, if you're going to rent a new home, you're going to put your security deposit down, deposit down and, and that is going to ensure that you are now going to be able to rent that residence, right? The Holy Spirit is our deposit guarantee. It's our, um, it's our promise that we are going to receive our new eternal residence. Um, and because of that, we can praise him, right? We can praise him. So our shepherd, he provides for you. Uh, will you trust him? Our shepherd leads you. Will you follow him? And our shepherd secures you. And will you praise him for that? So this, per this first parable of Luke 15, the shepherd and the sheep, it, it is telling us that we as sheep are completely dependent on the shepherd to provide for us, lead us, and protect us. So let's keep looking through uh, the ways that God describes our relationship with him. we got the shepherd and the sheep. The second one is the worker's and the wages. Back in Luke chapter 15, verse 8, it says this, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? That word, uh, the silver coin, if she loses one coin, the, that coin is, uh, the word that they use is a day's worth of wages. Um, that's why I went with worker and wages, because this was not just like a penny that she lost, but this was a good chunk of money that she lost. So, so God is searching for us like his wages, like he paid for us, right? Um, and, and to kind of flesh this idea out more, I want to talk about Colossians chapter 1. Uh, they're going to be up on the screen, Colossians 1. The first one is this, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. It says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. That's a beautiful passage. Um, this, it says that all things were created by him, through him, and for him. So our created design belongs to God. That, that is the way that we were made. We were made to be his. We were made to be God's creation. We had perfect communion with him where, where we were together with him. We walked with him. We talked with him. Um, in Genesis 3, it says that Adam recognized the sound of God walking in the garden. Uh, my wife and I, we live in Oakdale. We have, uh, like we said, a thousand kids, but we have a two-story house. And, and when my wife and I are watching TV, the hallway upstairs is right above us. And we can hear who is walking in our house based on the way that their footsteps sound, right? My youngest daughter, um, she is tiny. She's seven years old. She is this big, just, just light as a feather, but she sounds like a herd of elephants when she comes down the stairs. Like, you just know that it's Evelyn. You're like, oh, there she is. That's Evelyn. She's awake now. And then um, Hannah is our middle daughter, and she is so sneaky. Um, I, she scares us every time she comes down the stairs. We can't hear her at all. And then my oldest daughter has learned how to sneak, um, which is scary. Um, but hopefully that doesn't bite me later. Anyways, but we can, but we can hear them. We, we can tell there's actually with Lila, her door 
her door creaks when she opens it. Um, so we know, we, but, but we know that because we've spent time with them and we've heard them walking enough that we can recognize their voice. So we can recognize their footsteps. So, so in this passage, we see that Adam recognized God's footsteps. That's how personal their relationship was. And that's how personal our relationship with God is supposed to be. We were made to belong to God. We were made to be his. But keep reading with me in verse 21, Colossians 1.21. It says this, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Colossians 1.21. Ooh, alienated, hostile, evil. Oh, those are, those are not good words. Those are not words that people like to be described as, Right? Our created design, it belongs to God, but our fallen nature belongs to sin and death. Our fallen nature belongs to sin and death. We were made to belong to Jesus, but instead we've sold our souls because of the sin in our lives to sin and to death. And that perfect communion that we had with God, it was broken. Our God is so good. Read with me in verse 22. This is this. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. He does two things in this passage. He reconciles us by his death to reconcile. Reconcile is such a beautiful word. It's what God does in our marriages. It's what God does in our friendships. It's, he, he reconciles us. He takes two people who were once enemies and he makes them friends again. That's what it means to reconcile. So, so what God is doing, we were alienated, hostile, and evil, but by his death, he has reconciled us. He's brought us back together with God. He's reconciled us. He has restored us, right? He's, he's brought us back to our factory default settings, if you will, um, as, as holy and blameless before God. Um, and he did that by redeeming us. We once belonged to God in the very beginning. We sold our souls, but God said, no, I want them. And he bought us back. He paid for us. My wife and I, when we moved to Belize, we sold everything that we owned in a yard sale and we bought one-way tickets out there. And at that yard sale, I remember this yard sale because I had a moment um, with a toaster. And I know that... I know that that sounds weird, but I had a moment with the toaster. I loved this toaster. We got it at our wedding. Um, it, it served me well for a long time. And it was a good toaster. Paid like, uh, we didn't pay anything. It was gifted to us, but it was like $40. Um, and we sold it at the yard sale. It had a $3 sticker on it. And that hurt me. That's a good deal for a toaster, right? Come on. Um, someone brings me the toaster. It's like, will you take a dollar for this? I was like, come on, really? And, and I was like, how about $3? And he's like, how about one? I was like, Ugh, okay, that's fine. So he gave me a dollar, he took the toaster. And I remember, I was like, I went to my dad. We did the yard sale at my dad's house because we didn't have a house. Um, so um, did the yard sale there. I went to my dad and I said, dad, it's just $3. I was like, it's $2 different. Why didn't this guy just give us these $2? And he said, well, David, here's the thing. An object is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. I was like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. That is the most profound thing that I had ever heard in my life. An object is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. And Jesus, the God of the universe, paid for you with his blood. Your your worth is immeasurable. It, it, there's, there's nothing that can define your worth besides that Jesus, God of the universe, paid for you with his life. So when God is searching in his house for his lost coin, he is not just like flipping over the couch cushions looking for some lost change, right? He is, no, he, he is sending his son to earth to spill his blood on our behalf so that we can be brought back into right relationship with him. That is what Jesus is doing when he's looking for his lost coin. So these parables in Luke 15, they tell us that we are utterly dependent on our shepherd, I just realized utterly is a good word for shepherd. Um, <laughs> utters. Um, no, you don't have to clap at that. That's, that's dumb. That's, that's what that is. We, <laughs> huh, get focus. All right. We are <laughs> I can't even say it anymore. We are very dependent on our shepherd. Uh, we are immeasurably valued by God. And lastly, we learn that we are loved without conditions by our Father. We are loved without conditions by our Father. 
so in this passage, and we're going to camp in, in Luke 15 for the rest of the time. Um, uh, in this passage, we see the father express his unconditional love to his son in three different ways. The first way the father expresses his unconditional love is that he gives the son what he wants. He gives the son what he wants. And, and hear me. Um, yeah, let's look in uh, verse 12. It says this, and, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So the son is essentially saying to his father, Dad, I wish that you were dead. I don't want to be your son anymore. I want the money that I'd get from my inheritance. And then I want to leave and go off on my own. He completely rejected the father and turned his back on him. And the, and the father probably... With great sorrow in his heart, he gave his son his inheritance. And I want you to hear me. This is not prescriptive. This is not a parenting tip. Um, we should not do this. Um, and in fact, this might be the one time in the Bible where, where God is actually going to give us what we want. Um, if you don't want him, he's not going to force himself upon you. He stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks and those of us who want him, we're going to open the door and we're going to let him in. And those of us that don't want him, we're going to look at him and we're going to shut the door and we're going to reject him. But he doesn't kick the door down to our souls. He waits patiently, not wanting for any of us to perish. But at the end of our lives, he's ultimately going to give us what we want. So we see that he gives him what he wants. The second way the father expresses his love to his son is that he runs. He runs to his son. Verse 20 says this, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. Luke 15, 20. His son rejected him, wished that he was dead. He squandered his money. First, we see the father uh, saw him from a long way away, and I think, that, I think the father was looking for him. I think the father was waiting for him. And, and, even, and even though it had been a long time and the son had been through a whole lot and working with pigs and dirty and nasty, the father recognized his son from a long ways away. He didn't give up on him. And God is not giving up on you either. And he never will. He ran to him. He embraced him. He kissed him. The older son, in verse 30, he, he told his dad, don't you know he was spending all this money on all these things, on prostitutes, on all of these things that are just not any good? And so word had gotten out, right? The, the father knew what the son had done, and he still chose to run to him and welcome him home. The third way the father has, expresses his love to his son is simply this, he chose his son again. But the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Verse 22. The robe and the ring and the shoes, they are all identifiers that, that the father didn't just welcome him back and say like, oh, hey, good to see you and now get to work. The father was inviting him back into the family. The, the ring was the signet ring. The, it, was, it was God saying, it was the son, the father saying that you are back in the family now. My dad, um, my, my dad, when he was uh, in my grandma's belly, um, <clears throat> when my grandma was pregnant, um, the neighbor lady um, got pregnant with my dad's sibling. Um, my grandfather, uh, biological grandfather, I, I think a good word is a scoundrel. Um, he, he, was, he was a scoundrel. And um, so my dad uh, never knew or uh, didn't have a relationship with his biological father, didn't have a dad growing up until he was about six or seven and until my grandpa, my papa, um, adopted him. And, um, and a couple years ago, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, what does, what does it mean, what does adoption mean to you? If you can sum it up in one word, what, what does adoption mean to you? And the word that my dad picked was chosen. And, and I just think that that is so beautiful, that, that adoption means chosen, right? Jesus, uh, the father, he chose his son again. But check this out. Jesus also chooses us. Because in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
to be adopted into his family. You who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He adopts us into his family. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your savior, you've been brought into his family. You've been given the ring and the robe. You are a part of God's family. He chooses you. He wants you. He picks you. Friends, you and I, we are 100% dependent on our shepherd. We are immeasurably valued by our God, and we are unconditionally loved by our Father. And no matter how far or how close you find yourself to God, you could know that you have a Savior that is pursuing you passionately. And to anyone who repents and believes, he has been given the right to say that I once was lost and now I'm found. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your great love that is poured out to us and displayed to us through these scriptures. God, I pray that as we are considering all of these things that you've done for us, the fact that you are a shepherd, that you um, search for us like a, like a lost coin, God, the fact that we are your children. God, as we reflect on this, God, would you just challenge our hearts in this moment to say yes to you? to give you this praise that you deserve. No, no matter where we're at in our lives, no matter the circumstances, you are good to us. You are a good shepherd. You have found us, you value us, and you love us. So Jesus, let us say yes to you in this moment. Let us worship you and thank you for all of the amazing things you've done for us. God, we love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you'd like to stand, we're going to continue on. Or, I'm sorry, finalize it with one song of worship. Yes, I will. Lord, we thank you. We choose to glorify your name and bless you, Lord. God that never fails when I fail me now you won't fail me now in the way and the same God is never late it's working all things out working out
Amen. Yes, we will. Amen. We'll bless his name through it all in Jesus' mighty name. We love you guys so much. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see you next time. If you joined us online, see you as well. All right. Have a great week, everybody. We love you. Thank you.